Plato says, and he's, uh, the book, The Republic, in which this uh, allegory is, is a study of what the ideal state should be like. But interestingly enough, the reason he's talking about the ideal state is because at the beginning of The Republic, he is asked, what is the ideal life? And he says, a state is just like an individual, except it's much larger. We can study a state far more analytically than we can study an individual. So if we know what a happy state is, we can transfer that knowledge and figure out what a happy individual is going to be like. So everything he says about the ideal state can be transferred to us individually. So here's what he says. He says, imagine that there is a society deep underground in a cave. No one in this society has ever been outside the cave. Um, when you are born into this society, you are placed in a rock chair. Your arms are bound uh, to the arms of the chair. Your feet are tied underneath you. And your neck is chained in such a way that you can't turn it to see people around you. But you can't speak to them. In front of you is a rock wall. And in back of you, on a raised platform, there is a bonfire, which is lit for 12 hours, and then it's allowed to go out for 12 hours, and then it will be lit again, and so on and so forth. Between you and the bonfire, there are people walking back and forth that are carrying placards, and these placards are in the shape of different objects, houses, people, animals, cars, and the light from the bonfire casts a shadow of these placards on this rock wall in front of you, and that's your world. And you get very good at figuring out how these things are going to work, how they relate with each other on that rock wall. And everybody's happy because nobody knows anything else. Um, then Plato says, imagine someone comes into this cave and takes the chains off of one individual. Now, if you're thinking carefully, which is hard to do late on Saturday evening when you're tired, but if you're thinking carefully, you'll understand that if those chains are removed, the person's muscles will have atrophy and it will be impossible for them to move. But let's play along with Plato here for a minute. He says um, it's going to be very difficult for them to move, but at least it will be possible. Um, so an individual takes the chains off of one, one person and says, I want you to come with me. So this person leaves his rock chair, goes with the individual, and they begin a rather steep ascent, which will lead to the exit of the cave. Now this ascent is difficult enough if you're a seasoned climber. For someone who's never used their muscles before, it's almost impossible. Um, as this person and the guide leaves the group, they leave the light behind. And even though the light is just firelight, it's not very bright, it's the only light this person knows, and he's suddenly cast into almost virtual darkness. A lot of times he feels depressed, he feels frightened, he misses his companions, but the guide is firm where he needs to be, and gentle where he needs to be, and finally, after a while, he's able to get this person uh, up to the exit of the cave. Here comes the wonderful part. Um, the guide arranges to have this person get to the cave just before dawn so that the sunlight won't blind him. <clears throat> and as the person stands at the exit to the cave, he looks out. He is looking east. The sky is inky black. He sees, for the first time in his life, a real moon instead of just the shadow of a moon. And as he looks at the east, the sky turns from black to gray to rose, and then finally the sun comes up. And for the first time in his life, he sees three-dimensional objects. Up until now, it's just been two-dimensional. For the first time in his life, he sees color. He's never seen color before. For the first time in his life, he sees a real deer instead of just the shadow of a deer. And this person's absolutely euphoric. He just he can't contain himself. He is so happy and so awestruck by what he sees. He runs outside the cave like a little kid, um, bounces around the meadows, uh, enjoying all of this. And then Socrates, who's telling the story in the Republic, takes a little break and he says, what shall we do with this person? Uh, shall we allow this person to stay outside or shall we send him back into the cave? And everybody who's listening to this story says, let them stay out. They've paid the price. Let him stay out and enjoy this life outside the cave. Socrates says, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to send him back inside the cave because everyone in the cave deserves to know that there is an outside. And this is the only person who can tell. So we send the person back down to the cave. The journey down, obviously, is much easier than the journey up. He's, he gets into his former seat. And he's still just as euphoric as he possibly can be. He's just bubbling over with enthusiasm and, 
and uh, overwhelmed by what he's seen, the sense of awe, and he says to his neighbors on the side, he says, John, Susan, you'll never guess where I've just been. And they didn't even know he was away because they can't see him. And they say, well, where's that? He says, I've just been outside this cave. You know what they say? What's a cave? Unless you've never been outside of one, you have no idea what a cave is, right? And he says, well, and he tries to explain, and they say, you may be hallucinating. What do you see up there in front of you? And his eyes haven't really adjusted yet to the darkness of the cave. He says, I, I can't really make it out, but it doesn't matter because these are just shadows. I've seen the real thing. I just, I haven't seen the shadow of that dog. I've seen a real dog. And they say, uh, you know, you need to talk to Paul, four seats down. He's a psychiatrist. I think he can help you. <laughs> and that's kind of where we leave the story. Education is the process of leaving the cave. And the end, I've been working on this, by the way, for a long time, because I knew I was going to talk to you guys, and I've been nervous, and I've been thinking about it. And I finally come up with this. The end of education is that. It's a sense of awe. I don't know of a better way to say, uh, to say what I feel, at least, is the end of education. Education doesn't have anything to do with making money. Education has to do with finding out who you are, with the ability to live life fully and completely, and to realize, as was said here a minute ago, to realize our own potential.